Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first fast pitch session of the 2019 ARPA E Summit. My name is Michael Campos, and I'm an ARPA E Fellow, and it is my pleasure to be moderating today's panel. So, uh, let's see. So, can we put up the first the first slide for this intro here? Oops, let's go back. Here we go. So. Uh, I want to say a couple things before we get into the talks here today. Um, first, that fast pitches are really the, they're one of my favorite things that RBE does, not just because we all get to get up on stage and give a talk on, on something new and creative, but because it really supercharges the RBE process of gathering feedback from the community, that's you all, and making our ideas uh, better and better and hopefully turning them into a reality. So today's fast pitch session is going to focus on carbon dioxide and carbon heavy industries. And to set the stage, I wanted to take a moment to, to uh, give a little bit of background here. So it's becoming more and more clear that all roads to two degrees C warming go through net zero emissions. And if you look at this plot here, we have line of sight to several tens of gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions through conventional abatement technologies, things like uh, solar, wind, nuclear. But then if you get down to these bottom wedges here, you, you start to deal with more stubborn emissions, about 20 gigatons a year of them. Um, these are things we don't know how to deal with in, in as nearly a straightforward way as the, the more conventional emissions reductions. Um, and in, in order to offset that 20 gigatons a year, about 20 gigatons a year of negative emissions is sometimes invoked. So I want to ask the question, and, and we're not talking about emissions for the moment, but just stuff. How much is 20 gigatons? This is, it sounds like a lot, but what does it actually mean? Well, you start with all the material that, goes, uh, that travels by truck in the US every year, and then you add up all the material that flows through pipelines in the US every year, and then for good measure, just throw on the global cement and iron ore industries, and you're, you're in the ballpark of 20, 20 gigatons a year. These are truly massive material flows. To put it another way, that's the equivalent of getting rid of 55,000 Empire State Buildings per year. So when you start talking about flows on the gigaton scale, you, you have to start thinking in terms of the global carbon cycle, where things are actually measured in gigatons. Today's talks will touch a variety of these areas, and I'll, I'll just give a brief introduction to each topic before launching into it. The first three talks will explore unconventional ideas in carbon capture and sequestration. Dr. Scott Litzman will talk about the future of carbon capture in an era of uh, flexible generation profiles and power plants. Dr. Dave Babson will describe what he's termed an anthropogenic Azola event. I'll let him explain the rest. Dr. Zara LaRue will talk about storing carbon dioxide permanently and stably in mineral form. Then the last two talks, we'll, we'll get into uh, carbon heavy industries for which we, we tend to not have great answers on how do you decarbonize. I'll give a talk about the emerging synthetic meat industry and uh, what role RPE might play in making it uh, a better decarbonizer of industry. And then Dr. Dave, too, will talk about uh, aircraft design in an electrified aviation future. So uh, before, before handing it off, I want to get the point across. This is, again, uh, an opportunity to engage with us. Our ideas are in various stages of readiness, and we're actively seeking outside input. We're available through a variety of channels uh, at the summit and afterwards. Uh, you can text in questions to the number shown here, 22333, and your message should read 660026, space, and then your question. Uh, you can also come find us uh, after this session here uh, at Coffee with ARPA E, which is 8 a.m. tomorrow and Wednesday. Uh, just find us around the summit as well, uh, and our email addresses are public as federal employees. So. You have a variety of ways to get in touch with us if any of this is interesting to you. So with that, uh, I'm looking forward to this series of talks, and I'll hand it off to Scott Litzelman. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Litzelman. I'm a program director, and I'm going to talk to you about carbon capture and storage, or CCS, which is a technology that can help decarbonize our economy, but it's not a thought of as being very flexible, which is a problem. And for the next minutes, I'm going to talk about why this is a problem and what we might be able to do about it. But first, I want to spend a minute talking about what CCS is. Now, there are different ways of capturing CO2. This is just one example. But the idea is at a power plant, you've got combustion, results in electricity being generated, but also flue gas. And this is a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, and some other stuff. The flue gas gets sent to an absorber. 
where the CO2 selectively reacts with a solvent to become a rich solvent, which is sent to a regenerator and it's heated up. Now when it's heated up, it releases the CO2 as a nearly pure stream, and that CO2 gets compressed and set in a pipeline for storage or use or whatever happens next. And the solvent goes back to the absorber. And this happens again and again. The solvent captures CO2, gets heated up and released, captures CO2, and on and on. The good part about this process is it produces dispatchable low carbon power. It doesn't have the variability concerns of renewables. The bad part is it's expensive. And the expense is really a double whammy. It's both capital intensive, it takes a lot of stuff to do CCS, but it's also operationally intensive that you have to supply energy to regenerate the solvent. Now, this is coming at a time where we hear all the time about how renewable power is very cheap, and every day there's a record low power purchase agreement for solar and wind, energy storage is getting cheaper, and so it's fair to ask, if renewables and storage are so cheap, and I'm telling you this is expensive, why are we bothering with this? Well, the answer is that deep decarbonization looks a lot different than the early stages of decarbonization we're in today. This is a paper from Joule from last year where the authors looked at the price of electricity under different CO2 intensities, so higher CO2 in the left, and as you go further to the right, closer and closer to zero carbon power. And the first scenario they looked at was just two types of resources, what they call fuel saving, which is like wind and solar, and then fast burst, which is storage and demand response. And what they saw is as you get closer and closer to zero carbon power, the cost of electricity increases by a lot, and the uncertainty increases by a lot. Now, if you compare that to a different scenario where you have what they call firm low carbon power, so nuclear, CCS, geothermal, at the higher CO2 intensities, they look pretty similar between the two, but in this case, as you get closer and closer to zero carbon power, the cost of electricity is a lot less, and the uncertainty is also a lot less. So what they concluded was that firm low carbon resources like nuclear and CCS could reduce the cost of deep decarbonization by 10 to 62%, which would be a huge savings. Now, the point of all this is to say that the value of CCS in the power sector really shines under deep decarbonization scenarios, but there's a catch. And the catch is, is that under that, the, the grid that CCS is gonna see is gonna look a lot different. So it's already gonna be partly decarbonized. There's gonna be a lot of renewables, there's gonna be storage, there's gonna be demand side management, it's gonna be flexible and dynamic, which is not what CCS was envisioned for. And now I wanna take you back to 1977, which is the year that CCS was first envisioned for a power plant for the point of reducing CO2 emissions. Now it's kind of funny because this morning, uh, Commissioner Sitton was also talking about 1977 as the year where uh, he mentioned the study about uh, dietary fat, but a lot of other things happened in 77. So one, the Apple II was released. The Apple II was a new computer. It had a one megahertz processor, four kilobytes of RAM, and cost over 5,000 in today's dollars. Also, a movie was released that year that you might have heard of. This is the world in which CCS for power plants was first conceived. Now, the technology itself has grown by leaps and bounds. There's been enormous improvements in CCS technology, but the paradigm that this is something that we're gonna bolt on to a baseload power plant has not changed since then. We need to update how we think about CCS, and I don't just mean update it for the world today. We need to update for where we think the grid is going to be in say 10 or 20 years. The way that we're thinking about that is we're looking at locational marginal price of electricity, or LMP, and how that might change under different renewable scenarios and for different types of renewables. So here's one example, this is just a sketch, for a region with lots of solar resources. And some people call this the duck curve. And in the middle part of the day, the locational marginal price falls a lot. It's easy to imagine a situation where, let's say we have a power plant with a marginal cost that looks like this. What this means is that certain parts of the day, the price of electricity is higher than the marginal cost to run the plant. The plant's on, it's dispatching, it's making money. But there are other parts, especially in the middle part of the day, where the marginal cost to run the plant is higher than the price of electricity. And if the plant's on, it's losing money. So what we expect is that power plants might operate like this. This is just an example for what, let's just say a natural gas combined cycle plant, it might look like this. It's on, it can ramp up and down very quickly, they can already do this. It can turn down to a low level for those midday hours where the LMP is very low, and then ramp back up for the evening peak. This is the power plant, and this is already happening, and they can already do this. The question is what it means for CCS. Now, when I say flexible CCS, it's not to say that the capture process has to follow this directly. It doesn't. But the two processes, the capture unit and the power plant, are coupled, 
And by having a power play that operates like this, it forces us to think about how we design and operate CCS systems in a way that is different than what's come before and hasn't received a lot of thought. So the way that we're thinking about it is a few different things. One, we're considering redesigning um, current processes. I gave you an example of a solvent process earlier, but there are other ways of doing CCS. At the very minimum, having a plant that operates as dynamically as what I showed you forces one to think differently about capital, about operating expenses, about efficiency, and it particularly emphasizes capital over efficiency as the capacity factor drops and drops. But there's lots of room to think about how we design these processes. There's also the possibility of integrating storage. This could be thermal, it could be something like liquid air or liquid oxygen, or even the CO2 capture medium. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind, though, is this is already a capital-intensive process. So if you say, Scott, I'm going to solve all your problems by throwing a lot more capital and storage and all this fancy stuff, that gets really hard. But if there's a way of integrating storage that's very, very cheap, it could create some opportunities. And the last thing we're thinking about is other services that the future grid is going to value. So one example is integrating with um, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, which is going to be a valuable service. Now, I admit that this part is a bit more speculative, because in the past, when people talk about direct air capture of CO2 versus point source capture, those are two different processes because the concentrations are so different. They're optimized for different things. But if you have a power plant that is basically an underutilized power plant and an underutilized point source CCS capability, could there be some synergies between point source capture and direct air capture? I honestly don't know the answer to that question, but it's one of the things we're asking because we're interested. The last thing I want to say is what we're really looking to do here is bring different communities together. Historically, when people have done CCS from the point of view of a power plant, they said, I have a power plant, I'm going to assume it's operating most of the time, and I'm going to design a gas separation process that works for that power plant. People can do this. What we're thinking about is designing a separations process from the point of view of the grid. What is the grid going to look for? And so what we're looking to bring together are people that do CO2 separation technologies, but other things. People that work in co-optimization, I mentioned storage and direct air capture, plant dispatch, modeling, controls, a lot of different things. We're looking to bring together a lot of different disciplines to think about how these power plants might be designed and operated. The last thing I want to say is this has been a growing area that people have been thinking about. I'm certainly not the first person to talk about flexible CCS, but it hasn't been an area of focus because nobody's asked for it. Well, I'm asking now, and I'd love to hear what you think. I've recorded a webinar, it's available online, that goes into much more depth about this. Um, I'm here, please come talk to me. I'll send you a link to the webinar. Um, I've got office hours tomorrow morning right outside here. I'd be very happy to talk to you and just get your feedback on the idea. With that, thank you very much. And now, to continue this topic of managing carbon, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. David Babson. Thank you, Scott. My name is David. I'm going to talk to you about engineering an anthropogenic Azola event. Now, I realize that many of you, perhaps most of you, perhaps all of you, don't know what I'm talking about when I say an Azola event or the Azola event. And that's OK. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But let's uh, start with this. The Earth has a fever. Surface temperature anomalies have been shown that uh, global warming is both ubiquitous and it is most pronounced in the northern hemisphere, uh, particularly around the Arctic region. And it's not going to be breaking news to anybody in this room that climate change is real and that humans are causing it. In fact, the Keeling curve shown here on the left documents the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The precision of this documentation over decades has been used to actually generate plots like that that are shown on the right that show the correlation between the accumulation of carbon dioxide and human drivers, specifically with the amount of warming that we have observed. And so we know that climate change is real. We know what is causing it. The question is, what do we do about it? How do we treat this fever? How do we engineer solutions that are proportional to the challenge? And are there examples that we can look to in history? Indeed, 49 million years ago, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was above 3,500 parts per million. And this amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere accommodated an environment that was warm enough to have turtles and palm trees at the poles. 
earth scientists refer to this as the hothouse earth. Now, obviously, this is not what we observe today, so what happened? What happened to change this was the Azola event. This was a biological event that uh, persisted and was able to remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And Azola are floating, rapidly growing plants that accumulate uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in their biomass. And during the Azola event, as they died, they sank to the bottom of the ocean, removing that carbon from the atmosphere. This process of biomass accumulation, death, and sinking was a mechanism to remove carbon. And this persisted for over 800,000 years, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 3,500 parts per million down to 650 parts per million, and enabling the Earth that we know of today, the ice house Earth, where we have ice caps at the poles instead of sea turtles and, and palm trees. And I give this example not because I am promoting um, this specific mechanism for carbon drawdown. I am giving this example to give you a sense of the scale of the engineering challenge of changing the climate or creating the infrastructure that is capable of changing the climate. And any engineered solution that we do pursue needs to be controllable, targeted, and safe for established uh, environmental systems and ecosystems. So let's consider what the treatment path is. My colleague Mike showed this plot earlier. The path to maintaining global temperatures below two degrees goes through zero. That is net zero emissions. Um, that means by the third quarter of this century, we need to begin removing more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than we are putting in. And I want to focus on these negative emissions technologies because their importance actually comes about well before that, that transition point in the third quarter of the century. In fact, to stay on this path, we need to rapidly deploy negative emissions technologies, achieving megaton scale removal by next year, gigaton scale of removal by 2030, and by 2100, we need to be able to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at a rate of 20 gigatons per year. Mike outlined how big that was in terms of current industries, and let me give you an example of what that would be in dollars that we might be able to have for a comparison. Assuming $100 per ton of CO2 removal, or $100 per ton for CO2 removal, and 20 gigatons, we would theoretically spend three times what we do on defense in today's dollars. We would spend twice as much as we do on federal health care programs, or twice what we spend on Social Security payouts. Any solution that we engineer, we need to service what we are predicting to be the largest industry on the face of the earth. We need to service that industry with technologies that make this low cost and energy efficient, because this would be a very significant cost for an economy to bear, but we must do it. So let me go over three types of uh, solutions. The first are biological solutions. Biological solutions leverage the natural carbon cycling of environmental systems, and advanced technologies and new strategies could be developed to augment the amount of carbon cycling in these systems and to increase the permanence of carbon in them. Uh, targeted, amount, uh, uh, targeted research could look at different types of systems, including coastal blue carbon and aquatic systems, forest and land management, soil carbon sequestration, or new technologies for soil amendments and nutrient management. Another strategy are engineered solutions. Engineered solutions can be designed unique negative emissions pathways that will enable us to remove, use, and stabilize carbon in uniquely constructed systems. Types of technology pursuits in this area include direct air capture, conversion and use, and enhanced weathering and, and mineralization. And my colleague, Zara, who's going to speak next, is actually going to go into greater detail on this aspect. The final set of solutions that I want to talk about are hybrid solutions. These types of solutions leverage the biomass from the natural carbon cycling that I talked about earlier and match this up with engineered solutions that, that prevent that carbon in that biomass from getting back into the atmosphere. This can include bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, advanced technologies to enable better utilization of biomass in construction and buildings, or stabilization of biomass in biochar that can be used for a number of different applications or land uh, 
applications. So we live in a diverse economy that is made up of you know, different types of industries as a function of their, their, their climate and geographical location. Here in Colorado, you have a very robust winter ski industry, and the coastal communities have fishing industries. One point I would make about the diversity of our economy is that there is one commonality. Most of the industries that we see today benefited from the burning and use of, of inexpensive fossil fuels, and it's time to think about how we do that. And the future negative emissions industry that we need to develop is going to be bigger than any one individual industry that we have today. And it will be a diverse and broadly distributed industry where we can take the types of technologies that I outlined in those different areas, adapt them to the various climates and regions, and employ them so that we can actually achieve the challenge of treating the fever that we have. It is incumbent upon us to ensure that we transition our economy to being a tool for managing carbon rather than the continued excuse for not managing carbon. So RPE is interested in perhaps understanding what types of areas we could be investing in advanced technologies to enable this future negative emissions industry. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I'll be here all week as well. I'd love to talk to you. I'll be at the, the coffee with RPE events and my email is here. So please reach out um, and tell me what you think. Thank you. And I'm gonna introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Zara LaRue, to give the next talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Zara LaRue. I am a fellow at RPE, and the topic of my talk today is on carbon sequestration. And as the title may suggest, the specific uh, carbon storage that I'm talking about today is carbon mineralization. Carbon mineralization is taking CO2, binding it with a mineral, and forming a carbonate. This is a natural process, uh, the result of which is evident in this picture on the screen where these white veins are actually carbonate that has formed in this rock. So essentially the idea is to take this natural process, engineer ways to uh, have the reaction proceed quicker and on larger scales to safely and permanently store carbon dioxide. And the big picture motivation um, is really encompassed with this chart that you've now seen a couple times it, during this session. Again, this chart kind of just shows the magnitude of the global greenhouse challenge um, as we drive down emissions. And the part that I'd really like you to focus in on is this blue section, which is our negative emissions. Um, and as you can see, by 2100, we're looking at at least um, needing to take out of the air and store on the order of 20 or more gigatons of carbon dioxide, which is quite a challenge. So the question I pose for you today is, what do we do with this 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide each year? And while we have a number of possible biological and engineering solutions to address this challenge, the reason why I'm focusing on carbon mineralization in particular is because when it comes down to it, the success of any carbon dioxide capture depends on the storage. So let's jump right in. What is carbon mineralization? Very simply, carbon mineralization is taking a metal oxide bearing mineral, here represented as MO in this equation, reacting it with carbon dioxide and forming a carbonate. This is an exothermic reaction, so heat is produced. Carbon mineralization is a safe, permanent, non-toxic, and scalable method for carbon dioxide disposal. This is a naturally occurring process. It is thermodynamically favorable. In fact, carbonates are the ground state of carbon. The challenge, though, is that this reaction is spontaneous on geologic timescales, which is mismatched with the number of years and decades that we have to draw down our emissions. So the idea is to speed this process up. So the resource, the source of these metal oxides are silicate rocks such as olivine and serpentine, as well as alkaline industrial residues like slag from steel production, as well as mine tailings. And because the product of this reaction is a carbonate, a stable solid, verifying and monitoring that the carbon is actually stored is straightforward. So in addition to very favorable thermodynamics, we have a very favorable uh, resource. Minerals are abundant. In fact, this is our largest resource in terms of both storage capacity as well as storage time for putting away our carbon dioxide. 
You can see here maps of the 48 contiguous U U.S. states um, where you can see where these minerals are located naturally. So these are deposits of um, rocks that are high in magnesium. As well, you can see on the screen a picture of a uh, mine tailings. So this is serpentine mine tailings from an asbestos mine in Vermont. So we have a great resource potential. We have great thermodynamics. And so when we talk about kind of the challenge in this area, I first just want to lay out um, some key definitions very briefly. There's carbonation potential, which describes the number of moles of carbon dioxide that can be converted. This is a property of the rock. So this will vary depending on the resource, but it is an inherent property. On the other hand, carbonation reactivity describes the extent of the reaction. And this is really a key component because it ties directly to capital expenditure. It sets the time scale for how long we have to complete the reaction and therefore how large our system scale will be. And the carbonation reactivity depends on the pretreatment and kind of the energy that we put in to accelerate this reaction. There are two methods for accomplishing carbon mineralization. They are in situ and ex situ. In situ is simply taking a carbon dioxide bearing fluid, injecting it in a suitable rock formation, and forming carbonates underground. Ex situ, on the other hand, is mining the mineral, reacting the mineral with carbon dioxide at the surface, and then disposing of the carbonates. So at this point in the talk, I hope you're thinking to yourself, this sounds pretty interesting, but what's the catch? And yes, there are a number of challenges in the carbon mineralization um, research. And a few of them are listed here on this slide. They include the need for high-grade energy. They include the need to further and with a higher resolution map um, our resource for both in situ and ex situ processes. We need to better characterize our full range of operating parameters to really find optimal processes. And of course, there's high capex. So I'll briefly dive into each of these four challenges um, and, and hopefully uh, share with you where I'm thinking and hopefully you can answer some of my questions. So the first is that um, the kinetics for this reaction are, are very slow. So to combat that, um, we need to put in high-grade energy input up front. This may be um, in the form of grinding and crushing the rock to increase surface area, as well as other pretreatments like increasing temperatures and pressures, varying pH and hydration. So the questions I have for you today are what are the most effective ways for accelerating the kinetics while decreasing the demand for high-grade energy input? And particularly for in-situ carbon mineralization, can we actually frack the rock to have um, these reactions proceed faster um, and higher capacities underground? The second challenge is resource mapping and understanding our subsurface conditions. So I showed some maps earlier which show kind of where the resource is located in the US. And those are great um, as a first kind of go round, but we need finer resolution. Um, we need to really understand what are the optimal places to, to inject CO2 for in situ mineralization as well as to mine. So how do we best identify these sites and how do we characterize feedbacks between permeability, reactive surface area, and reaction rate? The third challenge uh, that I mentioned is really characterizing the full range of operating parameters. So we have a number of dials that we can you know, dial up and down, whether it's temperature or pressure, and we really need consistency between experiments so that we can compare and find you know, not just local optima, but global optima. So a few items um, that I'd be interested in exploring is understanding how we can kind of pursue this consistency, understanding ways that we can deal with passivation, um, thinking about ways to actually use the heat that's produced during this reaction and how best we can verify in situ processes. And lastly, the component that kind of ties everything together is capital expenditures. So the high grade energy input or the process that we use is a function of the resource potential, um, which again is a function of the process. So these are all iterative, this is all connected, and they all affect the capex. So the carbonation reactivity or um, the intense, how intense the reaction is affects capex and the goal is that we need to drive down the cost. So I'll leave you with this. Negative emission technologies are vitally important. We need to draw down, draw down the cost. We need to um, focus more on areas that we do not fully understand because we're gonna rely on these technologies in the next few decades. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, I will be here all week, but I will be at the Coffee with RPE on Wednesday morning, and I can always be reached via email. So thank you.
Next, I'd like to introduce Michael Campos to come back for his fast pitch. Thank you, Zara. And could we, could we take a moment to throw the, um, the text in number back up onto the screen? We haven't shown that in a little bit. So again, so once we have this up, right, so you can, if you have questions for any of us, we'll be answering them all at the end. Well, not all the questions, but we'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing all the Q&A at the end. Uh, you text the number 22333, and then you add the, the attached number here, followed by a space, followed by your question. Great. So uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, what I see as a fork in the road for the emerging synthetic meat industry. And I, I want to get this out there right up front. Uh, we're, we're in Colorado, a, a major beef producer in the US. I'm not a vegetarian, and I probably won't ever be one. That actually informs kind of where I'm going with this talk. But if you start to look at the global meat industry, a few things become very clear. First is that it is a carbon-based fuel, and it emits more than every car, boat, plane, and train combined, and not by a little bit, by a lot. Second is that it's, it's an extremely popular carbon-based fuel. Conservatively, 92% of Americans eat meat. Even India, which has the lowest numbers by far, is still about 60 to 70%. These outsized greenhouse gas emissions stem from fundamentally low production efficiencies. Um, you go from poultry all the way to beef, you're looking at production efficiencies of about 2 to 13 percent, and that's just including the calories that goes into the animal versus the calories that come out of the animal. If a, if a coal or a natural gas plant posted numbers like these, it wouldn't be in business very long. So on top of that, uh, Western-style beef consumption simply does not scale, although more and more countries are starting to eat, eat meat like, like uh, Western countries do. So uh, what, what, this, what this half index here shows, is it, it asks the question, if every country on Earth ate beef like X country, how much of the Earth's, Earth's habitable land would that require? Anything above 100% is fundamentally impossible without significant technology improvements. So how do you decarbonize this industry and scale up meat production at the same time? And I want to start you with a quote. We shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. The person who said that was Winston Churchill, and he said it in 1931. So in the last couple years, we've actually started taking this advice and figured out a couple ways to, to do just this. So the first is called plant-based meat, and you, you genetically engineer cell or yeast to, to produce plant proteins, which are then processed into a meat. The second is cell-based meat, where you actually grow mammalian tissues in cell culture. The former is much more advanced than the latter, especially when it comes to, to the concept of the life cycle analysis. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this in, in a bit, but plant-based meat gets you about a 90% greenhouse gas reduction. Cell-based meat is really unclear. So if you've heard of this space at all, you've probably heard of Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat. These are the, the titans of this emerging industry. Um, the, the, they're selling incredibly well-engineered products. They've, they've got uh, adequate funding. They're selling, they're selling in, in stores and restaurants, and they have buy-in from the, the folks in this industry who matter. On top of that, there's a wave of other startups in their wake um, doing their own approaches. So it, it naturally raises the question, okay, the private industry is doing this pretty well. Why on earth should RPE be involved? And so my argument here is that the, if, if the goal is decarbonization, the current approach actually won't get the job done. I have kind of three, three lines of reasoning here. The first is that just generally, uh, novelty tends to wear off in a lot of consumer products. Um, remember the Atkins diet and the line of products associated with it, you don't see those very often anymore. If you get past that, then you reach the opt-in problem. There will always be real burgers next to uh, a plant-based burger on the menu, and you need to look no further than the Mountain Pass Sports Bar here at the Gaylord. <laughs> If you get past that, then you hit what I'm calling the, the Turing test. Um, basically, humans evolved to, to, to crave meat and to know when food is slightly off because we're worried about getting poisoned. Obviously, the stakes are a lot lower here in a plant-based burger versus a, a, a beef burger, um, but the same concept, I think, applies. I would love to be wrong about all three of these, and I, I hope I am, but uh, I think it's at minimum worth a hedge. So, how do you actually start to, to avoid gigatons of emissions per year in this industry? And I'll start with a very simple formula, just greenhouse gas reductions are equal to the, the reductions per unit times the market share of the product. And I've plotted a couple fronts here showing specific greenhouse gas reduction milestones. 
And I, I've made some conservative assumptions about the industry size and growth rate um, and product replacements being zero sum. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, plant-based meat gets you about a 90% per unit reduction. Earlier this year, Barclays put out a study showing that, uh, or projecting that up to about 10% market share is achievable with products like these. If you take them at their word, this gets you to just north of half a gigaton a year emissions avoidance. Of course, the, the other approach and the one that I want to put forward here is the, the sheer volume-based approach where maybe, so if we take a wild guess and say that cell-based meat gets you about a 50% reduction in emissions per unit, then you reach parity with plant-based meat at about 20% market share and you hit a gigaton at 30% market share. So whatever it is, it has to sell like crazy is my point. So how, how do you design something that does just this? So I'll, I'll turn to uh, Joy Ito from the, from the MIT Media Lab who, who came up with a framework to think about alternative meats uh, in terms of number, uh, number of levels. So level zero is, is just be vegan, eat only plants. Uh, we're at level two right now with, with Impossible and Beyond. We're, we're selling plant-based meat commercially. Level four, or cell-based meat without any greater superstructure, is in R&D at companies like Memphis Meats. But where we want to get to is level six, or what, what, what's termed designer meat. So what, what could that look like? It's really not clear to me at this point, and uh, this is part of my ask for, for you all to think about this. I don't know what it should look like, but I have some design principles in mind. The headline here is the world needs to crave it, and I, I take inspiration from the Cheeto, where it's made from corn and dehydrated cheese, but I didn't even know that until I started researching for this talk. So you have, to, you have to ruthlessly optimize flavor, textures, nutritional profiles, production methods. Whatever the product is, it's got to stand on its own. It can't be a green product. It can't be a sciencey product. It can't be just as good or, or inconvenient in any way. And it has to reach cost parity or ideally an advantage. So in order to get there, I think we need a couple of specific lines of innovation. The first and I think most important is bioreactor design. We need tissue engineers and chemical engineers to start talking about the question, how do you grow complex superstructures both rapidly and delicately? I think this will draw upon a variety of, of concepts, obviously in the tissue engineering space, but the chemical engineering space as well. It's, it's very unclear what the ideal reactor should look like here. Additionally, we'll need some concurrent innovations alongside this, uh, such as inexpensive medium development. That needs to come down by orders of magnitude and cost. Uh, improve life cycle uh, assessments, 100% error bar simply won't cut it. And then it would be helpful to have a design endpoint in mind that will inform the overall reactor design process. So I think this could be a win-win-win. Uh, the consumer obviously gets, gets better products made of real meat with, with features that we'd like designed in. The agricultural industry, I, I think, can actually benefit quite substantially from this too. Uh, it, this system will still rely on traditional agriculture to feed cells grown in, in petri dishes or, frac or factories or bioreactors. And I think the industry can, can reap some of the spillover effects from this industry. And then if you, if you zoom out and look at the US, um, the, the US has an already strong agricultural export position. I think, this is a, I think this is a unique opportunity to actually improve the military supply chain by engineering in properties like shelf life for meats. And it gets to do all this while decarbonizing a really tough sector of the economy. So with that, uh, we want your feedback. This is a theme of the session here. Um, we have a, a, a variety of questions we're, we're looking to answer, and there's a variety of ways to get in touch. So again, you can text in questions. You can meet up with us after this session. Um, I will personally be at, at Coffee with RPE at 8 a.m. tomorrow, just outside in the hallway here, and my email is here. So with that, thank you for your time. And I will hand it off to Dr. Dave to, to close out the session. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, David Tu. I'm a program do director at RPE. I'd like to uh, today talk to you about the challenges associated with decarbonizing, decarbonizing our aviation industry. I'm doing this because you like your input on ideas on how to achieve this. But before talking about problems and challenges, I'd like to talk about successes, to, just to give you an idea of how, actually tra how transformationally successful the aviation industry has been. And I'll do this with an anecdotal example. Uh, specifically, uh, of before we flew overseas, we actually rode via boat overseas. Um, and this was not that long ago. Um, and specifically, uh, before uh, we rode on, rode on modern jet aircraft, we rode on coal-powered steamships. There's an example of one, of one that's pictured here. This is actually the SS Paris, which actually coincidentally is the ship that my grandmother traveled over uh, when she went from New York to Paris in 1925. 
between her diary and Wikipedia, I did some math on kind of the propulsion system and how energy efficient it was. It carried 2,100 passengers. For, it took six days to go across the, uh, the Atlantic. It consumed 5,400 tons of coal, um, and which means it had an emissions rate of one, over one kilogram of CO2 per passenger kilometer. The efficiency of the propulsion system was about 10%. It required about 25 megawatts of power continuously. Now, if you compare that, now 90 years later, in 2015, I flew to Paris um, on the 767 300ER. It's one of many trips to Europe so far. Um, it carried 350 passengers rather than six leisurely days. It was six very cramped hours. Um, it burned only 24 tons of kerosene and emitted roughly 100 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer, certainly a transformational change from where we were just 90 years ago. Uh, at the same time, the propulsion system was about 30% efficient, and it put out about 30 megawatts of power during cruise. So certainly, aviation has been a transformational technology as far as society, and, and it, we're a much more interconnected world than we were 90 years ago. Um, but of course, challenges come with that. We all know how cheap it is to fly, how it's not that painful, we're all willing to pay the price. And so more and more people are traveling more and more miles per year. This is basically a plot of, of revenue passenger kilometers per year. As on some, this, is, this chart was put together in 2012, so it contains historical data. So back in 1995, we traveled two trillion passenger kilometers per year. The growth rate is about 5% per year, uh, historically, as well as that's projected into the future. Um, and we're more or less on target in 2017 uh, with this chart. So in 2017, 4 billion passengers traveled uh, 7 trillion kilometers. Uh, and in 2037, 8 billion passengers are predicted to travel 14 trillion kilometers. So certainly aviation is, has really enabled a much more interconnected world. Of course, with that come challenges. Uh, and the challenge really is, is illustrated here in this uh, chart illustrating really the carbon intensity of the various modes of transportation. As you can see, from a carbon perspective, we should all be taking the train at 14 grams per kilometer per passenger. Um, but we tend to, fl to fly uh, frequently in, in the US, and that's a very effective way to go. Um, it's also the most carbon intense mode of transportation, according to the European Environment Environmental Agency in 2014, uh, as illustrated here. Um, and, and so, but it's, it may get worse before it gets better, in some sense, because certainly the slower we fly, the less energy we need. But the more we spend on, in a cramped aircraft, and none of us really want to do that. We would all rather get from A to B as fast as possible. We actually, at one point not that long ago, we had the Super the Concorde, which flew Mach 2 between uh, Europe and, 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 and North America, and actually worldwide. Um, and there's actually a move to reintroduce the uh, supersonic air travel, certainly from the business standpoint, as well as in commercial aviation. Um, this will certainly be a wonderful thing from a passenger perspective it makes the environmental challenge much more complicated, which I'll talk about on, on the next slide. So I was told that I, I could have one complicated slide uh, in my presentation. Just to give you fair warning, this is it. Um, and I think that was actually very good advice. So what I wanted to do is put, put an equation on the chart that illustrates uh, really what are the drivers for e emissions of CO2 as a function of, of really the metric that's of interest. So this is kilograms of CO2 per passenger kilometer. There are really three things to worry about. There's the aircraft, there's the propulsion system, and there's the fuel that you use. The aircraft parameters are there in blue, and there's really two of them. It's the weight of the aircraft and the passengers, uh, effectively, uh, per passenger, and the lift to drag of, of the aircraft. Um, just I talked about supersonic aviation um, a slide before. And just to give you a sense of the, the weight, if you look at the 767, which I showed several slides ago, that's kind of a state-of-the-art state aircraft, it is basically has a weight of 1,400 kilograms per passenger, the Concorde was 500 kilograms per passenger. So basically, it's three times the weight per passenger, roughly, that a, a subsonic aircraft is. The lift-to-drag ratio of a modern subsonic aircraft is 20. The lift-to-drag ratio of the Concorde was 7. So if you do the math, basically, all else being equal, the Concorde would emit eight times the CO2 per passenger kilometer that a modern jet aircraft would be at the same propulsion system efficiency with the same fuel. So the other two levels, levers that we have, so, we can, so in order to reduce emissions, we can work on reducing the aircraft to weight, we can work on increasing the lift-to-drag ratio, improving aerodynamics. We can also work on the propulsion system efficiency. Uh, the propulsion system for modern, uh, for modern subsonic aircraft, uh, and actually supersonic aircraft really aren't that horrible as well, the, the average efficiency during cruise is about 35%. So certainly the first law would suggest we have a great deal of runway to go 
to improve that efficiency. Of course, the real the technical challenge becomes improving that efficiency at an acceptable weight with an acceptable fuel. And that's no easy task, which is why we're asking for your help. And lastly, and clearly the only way to zero carbon emissions is through the fuel. Um, none of those other parameters can be either go to infinity or go to zero. So really the fuel is the only way to get carbon out completely. Of course, the challenge with aviation is energy density is absolutely critical to the economics of the aircraft, and you really can't sacrifice it much in order to have an economically acceptable fuel. So we need low, preferably zero carbon intensity fuels that have as an energy density that's as good as JP8 or even better, would be more preferable, is safe and is economically attractive as well. So in sum, what we're looking for, your help in identifying, we have really, we can break down our technology needs into two broad categories. It's the fuel, the energy storage, perhaps the battery, low carbon intensity, high specific energy, low cost. Secondly, we can look at the aircraft and the propulsion system itself. We want lightweight, low cost aircraft, aircraft concepts, subsonic, subsonic perhaps supersonic, and lightweight, low cost propulsion system ideas as well. There are a number of us at RPE that are actually thinking about this topic at this point. Um, various, uh, and actually I'd encourage you to reach out to any and all of them. Um, my colleagues and myself will be at the uh, uh, coffee um, hours tomorrow morning as well as Wednesday. And our email addresses are there in the slide um, as well. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And actually I think we'll answer some questions now. So thank you all very much um, for, for your time and attention. Uh, now we'll, we'll turn to a, a Q&A for the last uh, 13 or so mission, minutes of this session. Um, and again, could we throw up the, I can't see the screens here, but it, could you throw up the, the text in number so we can continue to get questions submitted? So uh, I'll start it off with uh, a question for, for Zara. Um, the question is, so you touched on this in your fast pitch, but what, what potential do you see for mine tailings or other mining byproducts to serve as a potential substrate for carbonate formation? So you, again, you touched on it, but maybe you could go a level deeper. Yeah, great, thank you. So mine tailings um, are a great resource. Uh, I see it as a kind of a, the early adopter, the low hanging fruit, um, because this is kind of a product that we already have and that we don't need to pay for. So uh, it's kind of to drive down the cost of carbon mineralization, why don't we start with something that we don't uh, do, that we don't need to mine that's already sitting there. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is that the scale of available mine tailings does not match the scale that we need to store carbon dioxide. Um, so it's not a long-term solution uh, for, for a full capacity of storage, um, but it is a great first kind of market to get started, again, because uh, your, your minerals are, are already produced. They're already sitting there ready, um, ready for carbon dioxide, and in fact, um, they are taking up carbon dioxide just from the air, um, but we can do it faster and better with that existing resource. Great. So th this question, this next question is for Scott, but I think it could it could equally apply to, to Dave and Zara as well. Uh, so how does RPE think about the possibilities of changing carbon capture from an economic drain to an economic gain? So I think that um, people, I, 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 I talked about carbon capture being expensive, but I think it, you know, levelized plus electricity is not the only metric. And if you just say the LCUE of this compared to this, um, it, it definitely changes as you get closer and closer to zero carbon power. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the CCS industry, the, there, are, there are multiple, there are several large scale power plants right now. Um, so things are actually moving and working. Um, I think there is a lot of opportunity to reduce the cost of like, again, CapEx intensification, there are multiple technologies that RPE and other, like the Office of Fossil Energy is funded. So there are tons of possibilities, mm -hmm. but I think part of it is we can't, if the, if the power sector is changing, we can't think about designing it the same way. But as much as I talked about CCS being expensive, I think if we get that right, uh, it could very well be competitive. Great. Anything, Dave, maybe, maybe you could add on uh, in terms of, of utilization, maybe what what kind of ceilings are we dealing with in terms of how much carbon we can reasonably utilize for a valuable purpose? Unfortunately, the amount of carbon that you can utilize if you were to make everything on, on Earth and all the carpets and everything with uh, renewable CO2 that you pulled out of the atmosphere, it wouldn't be sufficient to um, 
achieve the amount of carbon drawdown that is necessary, and it wouldn't be sustained over the period of time that is necessary. So a great deal of carbon is going to have to be removed from the atmosphere and just stabilized, either put in underground in geological formations or turned into rocks. Um, and you know, to how you frame the question of how do you make that um, uh, economic you know, gain instead of a, a, of a drain is actually a function of how you, um, what, what the um, incentive structures are in the economy for what is, what is profitable. This industry uh, that needs to be created will need to have its own um, profit capabilities. There should always be incentives to make the technologies lower cost and more energy efficient. Um, but ultimately, there will have to be a decision that is made to uh, create the economic environment to um, pay for uh, the reduction of the legacy emissions that, that we have accumulated as a function of the economy that we've had in the past. And Mike, can I just add to that? I think it's important when we're talking about carbon capture and, and, and capturing and storing, um, it's important not just to look at the cost of doing that, but the cost on our society if we do not do that um, and, and if we don't deal with these emissions. Thank you, Sabir. So Dave, this next question is for you. Dave too, not Dave Babson. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the, the carbon footprint of electrified aviation itself, because I mean, given the, just the bill of materials and whatnot, everything that goes into even an electrified plane, it will still have some carbon footprint. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. Um, it, it, it certainly will, and, and that didn't factor into the estimates that I provided. But certainly, when you're focused on carbon, you have to focus on the operational emissions as well as the emissions, effectively, they might call them the capital emissions that really go into the construction of the aircraft and the energy storage system. And it's certainly something to be to be considerate of and, and, and worry about. Great. So uh, I'll, I'll take this next question. Um, Given the poor track record of corn ethanol on, on life cycle uh, energy efficiency, how efficient can artificial meat be when based on soy or corn inputs? Um, so while I, I, don't, I don't claim to know exactly how, how this industry is going to develop, I want to, that's actually a, a major question I want to ask you all. Um, so there's only a couple life cycle analyses out there on, on specifically cell-based meat, and they really range, again, the, the error bar on these, on, on these uh, estimates are, is greater than 100%. Uh, some studies say that you will have a 95% reduction in life cycle emissions. Others say that if you look at the several hundred to thousand year time scale, this will actually produce um, worse warming effects because of the, the relative amount of CO2 versus methane in the waste stream. Um, so basically, I don't, I don't have a great answer to that. Uh, it's, this will depend on on the reactor design and the efficiency of the cells in uptaking nutrients and growing into, into useful tissues. It'll depend on how much tissue you maybe have to throw away before actually packaging and selling a product. Um, these, are, these are uniquely technological questions that I think the, the people in this room may be able to answer in the future. Okay, so let's see. Let's see, okay, so for, for Scott, in, in direct air capture, uh, how much net carbon dioxide can be captured per square meter, per year, uh, you know, a, accounting for, for materials cost and emissions? And uh, maybe, maybe you could link it back to um, one of the ideas you proposed of linking direct air capture to a flexible CCS at a power plant. Sure, and, and that's a good question. I'll start by answering that. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, but I think that, um, so, so Carbon Engineering had a, had a publication in Juul last year um, with David Keith and others, and they go through in, in pretty great detail about the process, both where the process is now, and it, it caught headlines. They said, you know, we could be as low as $92 per ton, which I assume is per ton removed, I think. Um, but we, they make assumptions around a lot of different process improvements that would take to get there. I think the thing with direct air capture is um, it depends a lot on the energy input. If you look at the thermodynamics, I mean, it's, it's very, very hard. I mean, it's a, it's a very dilute separation. It is incredibly energy intensive. Um, so I think the, the nature of the energy input matters a lot. So for some of the companies, they're saying we can use low-grade waste heat, which has some kind of footprint. For carbon engineering, they need you know, 900C basically direct natural gas oxifiers. So, so, so my point was that the energy input for direct air capture varies a lot across the different companies doing it, and whether or not if you had a power plant that was, the power plant itself was dispatching lower, but the CCS capability was at its steady state, your effective capture rate would actually increase. 
And how does that increased rate kind of affect the math when you compare that with the direct air capture? So, so it's, it's complex, but um, it is something that we're thinking about. Great. Uh, this next question is for Dave, too. Um, so aviation is less than 3% of US greenhouse gas emissions. Um, is this the best focus area for RVE? Um, it is certainly a potential focus area. It's currently 3%, but it's an area that's growing very rapidly. And certainly, the faster we want to fly, the more of a problem it's going to become. So it's certainly one of many focus areas I suggest we think about. Great. So um, I'll take the next one here. Uh, and there, I'm going to lump two questions together. One, uh, they essentially amount to, uh, what about insect protein and what about fish protein? And in, in, in response to those questions, I think I would, I would so I would first say that they are much less uh, greenhouse gas intense than, than um, poultry or, or beef or pork. Um, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but they're, they're substantially less. That being said, I, I think one thing that, that we have to work in, I think one of the design constraints here, and I showed this on my Cheeto slide, is that people have to really, really want this stuff. And um, I, I don't, based on the research I've done, I haven't seen a ton of, of shifting in the American consumer market toward those. Uh, toward diets only including those. So I, I think that may be a tough sell, although if you start looking outside the US, you may have some, some better inroads there. OK, so let's see. Uh, so uh, Zara, this next one is for you. Um, how much heat will be exothermically produced for mineralization of 20 gigatons of CO2? Uh, that's a great question. So um, on, on a molar basis, there is about um, a range from maybe 60 to 180 kilojoules produced per mole of carbon dioxide. So to put that in perspective, that can be up to over 40% of the heat that was released in the initial combustion of the carbon that released the carbon dioxide in the first place. So it's actually a significant amount of heat. And kind of the idea behind that is that if we can use this heat and direct it and um, get value out of it, it's, it's actually very significant. Mm -hmm. OK. One moment. So uh, for Scott, do you think there's a particular CCS technology that's, that's more flexible than the others? Essentially, maybe like what, what's the, the horse leading this race at this point? So I've asked people that question. I think the answer is it's too early to tell. Um, and again, you know, when I, flexible CCS is not a very precise term, to be honest. Um, there's a variation where the capture process might not need to alter its state that much. It definitely needs to handle different CO2 mass flow rates. And I think on the back end, on the compression side, I think that's going to be particularly challenging because compressors are not designed for that. But as far as the capture medium between oxy combustion or sorbents or solvents, um, I don't think that there's any particular clear winner. Now, if you want to talk about storage, like I mentioned, the CO2 capture medium, you know, that's something that people really associate with solvents or sorbents. I think membranes can't quite do that. But as far as the, the type of capture that's most amenable, I think that's wide open. OK, great. And so we're, we're just about out of time. So I'll, I'll uh, just I'll take the last question here. Should I buy stock in Beyond Meat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No comment. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much.